Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to cover 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4 today, believe it or not. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. You know, when I started this series and, and said we were going to go back and do more doctrinal type messages, I knew that. I kind of had so many Sundays planned and I had some other messages that I had planned to add to that. And I, I couldn't decide and so finally I decided, okay, the extra lessons that I would planned just in case I decided to keep going with them. And this was, uh, last Sunday's was going to kind of wrap things up and then I decided that we would go through the rest of the summer talking about doctrinal things because thankfully... Everybody has responded well to these messages for the most part. There's been, there's been a few questions, a few things that have, that have come up. Because we're such a diverse group. We're uh, coming from many different backgrounds and thought processes and traditions and, and things. But we all have a respect for the Word of God and a willingness to, to approach from the Word of God. But I'll be honest with you, when I started planning today's message and uh, really studying the text, the two texts, that I, I felt like kind of like uh, John the Baptist um, and, and thought, wow, you know, you can lose your head in today's culture. Uh, especially this week, there were two different news stories that I read. Uh, one about the IRS beginning to interfere in churches and then the second was that the IRS is going to begin monitoring churches. Um, they're expanding their bureaucracy and here I am talking about it on tape but I don't care. Uh, that the IRS is going to begin monitoring church services and sermons specifically. So if they're uploaded, if they're online or they're available, they're going to be listening to see if there's anything that they could possibly uh, use again the IRS I mean what business is it of theirs but the IRS has been able to scare churches and church leaders since the Johnson Amendment was added to the Constitution the Johnson Amendment basically says that there can be no kind of political stuff go on in a church well tell that to some churches around this nation especially in the Atlanta area and the Mobile Alabama area where there have been political rallies and things going on on Sunday morning and they call it church. So I don't really have that fear, but beginning and approaching this text, I was a little bit, a little bit leery because it meddles in our lives. And so I thought about, I thought about John the Baptist and I thought about his bravery in, in confronting the culture. Of course, he did lose his head over it. Uh, in the situation, but um, hopefully no naked woman will dance before the king today and call for my head. So, um, but I thought about John the Baptist and I thought, you know, modern day John the Baptist, I thought, well, so I started to come in this morning and have all kinds of things, but I just brought one. But I'll tell you uh, what else I thought about. I thought about John the Baptist. First of all, he showed up he had taken the Nazarite vow, so we looked a lot alike, long hair, long beard. He was dressed in, in goat skin. Well, I didn't have goat skin, but I do have deer skin. So I thought about, well, I'll put my deer skin on. And I thought, he ate locusts, he ate locusts and wild honey, and that didn't really sound good. So I almost had Deb make me some biscuits and gravy, but I figured I would start a ride if I was up here eating them in front of you. But I thought about... Man, this thing is, by the way, very nice cover to cover up with when it's cold. Believe it or not, it keeps the deer warm. Um, but when you think about um, our culture today, our culture is no different than the culture of the first century. We often think that we're worse when we're not. That wherever people have been sinning, it exists. Bad exist because there is sin there. And Paul writes to Timothy and he's saying some things and he's being very... Uh, at times we have a role in life where we have to play the prophet. Sometimes we have to play the comforter. We play the priest where we bring comfort. Sometimes we, in life we play the role where we're the counselor. And so we all have roles that we will play from time to time and we will put on different hats to, that we wear. And so today 
when we talk about the doctrinal issue that we're going to talk about, it, it comes down to this, that we have to be like the prophet. We have to be saying it's time to change, that there has to be a repentance, that there has to be some things that come about because we live in terrible times. And because we live in terrible times, we have to be prepared for that. And Paul writes that to Timothy and he says, guess what, Timothy? You're going to be living in some terrible times. He's not writing to Timothy and saying 300 years from now it's going to be bad. He's saying, Timothy, there's a time coming in your life where things are going to be bad because of people. Because wherever people are involved, things are going to happen. I got to thinking about it historically. Now, listen very carefully to what I'm going to say because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying, okay? Before 1933 in Germany, inflation was horrible. That inflation was so bad and their money was so worthless that it could a loaf of bread would cost you a million Reichsmarks. Now, imagine having to go down with a million rash marks. You know, you would take bags just to get a loaf of bread because the money was so worthless. It took all that paper to buy a loaf of bread. Unemployment was through the roof. And Adolf Hitler comes on the scene and he makes a promise, hey, I'm going to change things. And when he becomes chancellor in 1933, and he becomes chancellor, and things begin to change, by 1935, the German economy had begun to turn around because he implemented some things in the economy that changed things. Now, I'm not a Hitler supporter. I think he was a horrible person. Okay? But he made some changes that brought it about. The bad thing is, we know what else he did where he wrecked the country and he wrecked the world and millions of people died because of him. American blood was shed because of him. So we know how bad he was. But if you look at the policy that he put into place, the problem was he made some things that economically made a change for the better for the German people. The problem is, when you have evil involved, evil will always produce evil. When Ronald Reagan was elected president, inflation was out of control, unemployment was out of control, and we lived in a country that had gone through not only the Watergate crisis under Richard Nixon, we had gone through a failed presidency of a man that was in office that was over his head. That is, a, that is what historians say. He was, over, he was in over his head. Good man, but in over his head. Ronald Reagan takes office and he has a promise about his economic plan. His economic plan, remember it was called trickle-down economics. Remember that? That was a term that, that was always called. And then one of the things that Ronald Reagan did was he stepped into office and he said, we're going to deregulate. We're going to take government's role out of the private sector. We're going to allow them to do things. Well, let me tell you something. When you unbridle some people, they will take off like a racehorse and they will produce things and they will help people and companies will grow and salaries will grow. But other people will look at it as an opportunity to grow themselves. And they will get rich and richer off of the heads and the backs of other people. So there was evil that took place. And so when you look at historically wherever people are there's going to be evil. Paul writing to Timothy he's not talking about his culture. He's talking about Timothy this is what you're going to face within the church. So let's begin reading. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. But mark this. 
There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Now, the sad thing is we read this and we go, oh, that describes the newspaper this morning. That describes whatever you, whatever news channel you watched. That describes the local news at 10 o'clock last night. He's talking to Timothy and he's saying, guess what's going to be happening within the church? That list, is that not, I mean that is like, when you read that list, you're just like, Wow. He says, guess what? There are going to be people, there are going to be people within the kingdom of God who are going to be thinking this way. Because their problem is they're, they're going to get so focused on themselves and it kind of builds off of what we talked about last week which was do this in remembrance of myself, right? No, it's do this in remembrance of who? Me being Jesus. How many of you, how many of you took off from here and forgot about the me Jesus and it became the me me? I mean, it, it didn't take me, you know, too long. Did any of you dare to go to Walmart yesterday or anywhere else yesterday? I foolishly made that mistake. I actually said, what is wrong with me? I walked in that store and went, good Lord have mercy. I described it like this to somebody, what I saw in the store. You remember in the Wizard of Oz when they arrive at Oz and they're getting made up to go see the wizard and they take the scarecrow through the restuffing process and you remember how everything's just going crazy as they're putting him through the machine and things are flying around and legs are going up in there? That's what it looked like to me when I walked in the door of Walmart yesterday. It looked like paper was flying, pens were flying, crayons were going everywhere. You saw children being thrown. <laughs> I mean, just things like that. I was like, golly, all to save on tax. Wow. It's get out of my way. Literally, to get from one side of the store to the other, you had to go through the middle part of the store. You could not cut across the, the section where the checkouts were. It was insane. When we finally left there, I was like, huh, I'm glad that's over. Paul says to Timothy, guess what? Mark it. Realize it. Think about it. Guess what? Not everybody is going to have your best interest at heart. People are going to take advantage of you. People are going to hurt you because, listen to this list, People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to parents. I, and the list just goes on and on and on. I don't need to break this down and define this for you. You understand it. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and following, he says to Timothy in his earlier letter, he says, you know why people are going to act this way? Because they're demon-possessed. He says they've, got, they've accepted the teachings of Satan and they're going to be denying people what they can eat. They're going to be denying people how they can... You know what's amazing is that 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 and following is often applied. I have heard people actually and read it where people would try to apply this to the Catholic church or whatever when, when in reality what he's saying here is, is that the church... People will come in, they will worm their way in, and they will want to take power, and they will want to control people rather than allowing the Spirit of God to control them. Rather than allowing God to work in their lives, they want control because where there is control, there is power. 
And what happens to us is, is that these things can so overtake us. And notice something here that he says in verse 5, because this is key in verse 5. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Notice what he's, what he's literally saying here is, and there are better translations of this than even what the NIV says here, but I'll give you my translation because it's just plain. He says they're going to be the most religious people on the block. They're going to be the people that are in church every time the doors are open. They're going to be the people that are known in the community as the pillars of the community. They're the ones that, oh, they're the, they're the people that, oh, they know their Bible, they carry their Bible, they have the ichthus on their cars, they have the stickers on their cars, they, they are down and they, they would never do anything, you know, to anybody that was bad and all that kind of thing. And he says, but they denied the power of God working in their lives. And he says that they're going to be involved because really who they are is not who they pretend to be when they're in church. Or when they're around other Christians. Who they really are is this ugly list that he gives us here. And you know the sad thing is, is that if we're truly, truly, truly honest, when we read that list, we can see ourselves in many of those categories, if not all at times. If we're just honest. We've all been boastful. We've all been proud. We've all been greedy. We've all wanted what we wanted when we wanted it. Let's just be honest. We have all at times wanted to look a certain way. Say, I want, to, I want to appear to be more spiritual than I am. I want to appear to be a certain way. And he says, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And he says to the church, don't have anything to do with people like that. Well, that's strong language, is it not? We don't like that kind of language. We don't like the kind of language that where, where the Bible would actually tell us that there are people we need to keep out of our lives. We go, oh no, we've got to be open to all. We're open to everyone willing to repent. Remember our message on the gospel? I said, I feel like we ought to open our assemblies every Sunday where we all ought to just stand up and, and just come to the microphone and go, hello, my name is Daniel and I'm a sinner forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And it has been six hours since I sinned. I mean, one of those things where we literally stand up and admit, yes, we are sinners, but the list that he's given us here is that, you know, the person that, the person's that, that prideful never says, I'm so prideful, right? The greedy person never says, I'm greedy, right? If they do, they make a joke out of it, right? We never, we never say, we never ever really, you know, unless they're the sociopath, you know, we, but we rarely go around admitting that that's where we are, that we, that we want whatever it is that's on that list there, that that's where we go. We rarely say, I hate my parents. Now when we're teenagers, we may think it, and we might dare to say it out loud, but we rarely really say, oh, I just hate my parents, I hate them, I hate them, I hate them. And he gives us that list and so he says, here it is, and he says, be aware of this, Timothy. Terrible times are coming because when the church allows itself to be made up of people who are saying one thing, it's called hypocrites, saying one thing and doing just the opposite, it's dangerous times. And he says, not only that, but guess what? They're going to be the kind of people that are going to try to take advantage of others. Listen to what he says. Verse 6, he says, They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of deprived, depraved minds who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected, but they will not get very far because as in the case of those men and their folly will be clear to everyone. Now listen to what he says. He says that the kind of people that are going to try to worm themselves into people's lives to take advantage of them. We've seen those kind of people. You know, we have... 
Monday night Bible study at our house. And most people, do you know that most people that know me when they come to my house, they rarely knock on the door. They just come in. Now, if, especially if I'm in Monday nights, the guys just come in. They just come in the door, you know. And they'll usually say, hey, you know, or whatever, you know. But I'm expecting them. The other night I sat down at, I sat down at the, to do something and the doorbell rings and I went, somebody didn't read the sign. Because believe it or not, there's a posted sign on my front door. You know, the city gave out these little stickers a while back and said, do not, do not knock on my door. I said, I don't need one of those. The city, the city doesn't get to tell me who I can or cannot have. I decide who will come to my house. Right? Y'all ever feel that way? You know, you want to dig the moat and raise the drawbridge at night and say, keep out! You know, that kind of thing. So the doorbell rings and I go to the door and I'm standing there and I'm looking at the guy and the dogs are barking and I go out and I go, what can I do for you? And I, I'm, I keep going like this. And I'm pointing at the sign and the guy's looking over my shoulder and he goes, uh, I'm just here to try to sell you the paper. So, well, I'm, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. You know, I don't want the paper. Leave. And so he leaves. Well, I come back. Deb goes, who was that? And I go, oh, some guy's selling the paper. And she goes, well, that's a weird thing. <laughs> She's going to kill me. <laughs> she, goes, she goes, well, that's a weird thing to be selling door to door. Why would they be selling paper door to door? I said, that newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't Dunder Mifflin employees, you know. <laughs> she was like, oh, well, I'm dead this afternoon, so, you know, goodbye world. <laughs> that was, hey, I could tell other things, but that was just... <laughs> yeah. So, he says, be careful. And then he lists these two guys. He says, he says verse 8, he says, but Janice and Jam... Uh, Janus and Jambres. Now, if you go back and you look, well, who were these guys that opposed Moses? Jewish tradition named the magicians. They told their names. Now, Moses in Exodus 7, he doesn't list them. Or, uh, yeah, in Exodus 7, he doesn't list them. He just says the magicians. But Jewish tradition actually names them and says that these two guys opposed Moses. Remember when Moses came in and he has his staff and he throws his staff down and it becomes a serpent? What do they do? They did the exact same thing. The only difference is Moses' serpent crawls over and eats hit theirs. Everything that he did, they would replicate it. They would say, oh yeah, well we can do that. Oh yeah, well we can do that. And they just keep opposing Moses to his face. And so he says, Paul says, there are people that were, that were opposing Moses. He says, get ready that people are going to be opposing you. If you take a stand against this, if you take a stand against wrong... There are going to be people that are going to be angry at you. You tell somebody that what they're doing is wrong. They will get mad. I've experienced, some of you have experienced this. Sometimes when we're dealing with people who are living in sin or doing something that are wrong, and we all of a sudden say, no, we, I can't be a part of that. Okay, then they, they throw out, what's their favorite term? They love to throw out, you're being judgmental. You're judging me. You're judging me because of, of what I'm doing is okay and you can't judge me on this. Well, you know, and so then you're like, well, am I being judgmental? Or they, they say, what's wrong with you? You need to get with the times. Things have progressed. You need to be more tolerant. All kinds of things will be thrown at you. And he says that just as Moses was opposed, he says you will be opposed. That people will stand up because, let me tell you something, is it or is it not? Now we say it is truly easy to stand up for what is right, but let's be honest. Let's be honest. At times when you're under pressure, it is very difficult to stand up and say, no, wait a minute, that's wrong. I saw... I, I was shocked by something that I saw. And 
I, a little boy was singing a song. And, and I, I witnessed this. This little boy was singing a song. And he was, he was singing it. And he was singing it. He was using the F, F word. And his parents just thought that was hilarious. And I said, that's not a good idea. And they said, why do you, it's cute. And I said, when he's 16 and he says he's leaving to go somewhere, and you say, no, you're not, and he says, F you, you, you come back and tell me. You come back and tell me it's cute in 13 years. If God gives me 13 more years in your life and you show up at my doorstep and God has allowed me to keep my memory, I swear to God I'll say, I told you so. In fact, I may write it down and file it away. And they were like, we just don't understand you. What's wrong with you? You just can't see humor in things. I'm like, I see humor in all kinds of things that I and I are, have similar humors. We see humor in things that nobody else sees humor. We'll just be laughing and laughing and laughing and everybody's sitting there looking at us. And other times somebody will be just laughing and laughing and laughing and we're going, I don't get it. That wasn't funny. I love humor. You're around me. I love to laugh. And I love kids. I love them. I had the cutest little boy in my office last Monday. And I just instantly fell in love with him. And he was just the cutest thing. And he was fascinated by my bass on the wall. And I said, you want to see a really neat fish? And he said, yeah. And I showed him my piranha. And he went, oh. Where'd you get that? And I looked at his mother and his mother was looking at me like, don't you dare. Because I almost said, at the pool. <laughs> but I didn't. Because his mother was giving me this look like, I will kill you. But we have to take a stand. And so he says, guess what? And he says, another thing too is, let me tell you something. People are not going to surprise you because what they are will be made public. Listen to what he says. Verse 9, But they will not get very far because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. He says, just expect it. Now, turn the page. Chapter 3. So how do we respond? What is our response to all of this? We're in the... We're in the church. He's, guess what? We know we expect that list of our culture. Because like I started off talking about, where there is evil, evil will abound. Our culture is not following Jesus. But as the kingdom of God, we say we are. So our lives have to be different. So listen to what Paul says to Timothy, verse 10. He says, You however know... All about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. What's he saying there? He says, guess what? If you live a good life, in other words, you know the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished, right? You do good, somebody's going to be mad about it. And so he says, if you strive to live for Jesus, you will, somebody's going to find a fault. You know, sometimes it just may be the fact that, you know, we get to thinking sometimes more of ourselves than we ought, or we get to thinking, well, I'm forgiven, and we get to looking down on everybody that's not. And so when we sin, they love to point it out. They love to point out when we fail. That's the reason I think we ought to run around going, Hello, my name is Daniel and I'm a sinner. Because if I admit that I am a forgiven sinner, it changes everything. That I'm a sinner, but I am forgiven through Jesus. Then it means something and so sometimes what's going to happen is we will bring persecution on ourselves. But go further at what he says. He says, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Okay, guess what? Our, our problem here is, is that one of the things that we will always want to do is that we will always want to strike back. Right? 
That's why we have such a hard time with what Jesus says. When Jesus says, turn the other cheek, we don't like that, right? I don't like the sound of that. Because if somebody does something to me, I want to do something back, right? You don't want to... You don't... You don't want to... Oh, you know, it's like, how dare them? They're going to get away with this. That's the, that's the difficulty with forgiveness. If somebody does something to you and they come and they say, please forgive me, and you forgive them, in a sense what you're saying is, and you know it in the back of your mind, if I forgive you, you get away with it. Right? Even though they've repented, even though they're truly sorry for what they've done, if you forgive them, you're allowing them to get away with it. And then, of course, you know, we go to God and we go, please forgive me. And God goes, I forgive you. And we go, we got away with it. But the problem is that when we see evil, we want to be evil to it. Now to notice what he says. Verse 14, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know that those from whom you learned it and from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. One of the things is that we must never give up in our faith and our trust that we have the Word of God. Now we've got to be loving and patient and, and all of those things, but we've got to trust in the Word of God. And we must never get away from it. And the second we begin to get away from the Word of God, we will lose everything because we will, if, if we get away, if we know, if we are in the Word and we know that the Word says something is wrong and then we begin to deny it, that's where the problem... In fact, listen further to what he says in chapter 4. The great text to uh, just about every Bible seminary, Bible college, whenever preachers graduate, will hear a message on this text. Listen to what he says in chapter 4. He says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of evangelists, discharge the duties of your ministry. He says sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, healthy teaching. He's saying, listen, that people... Have you ever been reading your Bible and you come upon something that is so convicting and you just want to close it and forget you saw it? I'll be honest, there have been times that I've read that and I went, oh man, I just... Do you know I got to thinking back on something? The last time, now I have taught through First and Second Timothy, but it's been several years ago. Now, our men's group did a lot of study from First and Second Timothy and Titus when we were talking about leadership. But the last time I preached through, and I did a, a whole series through, I started in 1 Timothy and went all the way through Titus, was the, the beginning of the second year I was here at the church. Because, let's be honest, we don't want to hear things like this. We want to hear, hey, let's be honest, we all want to hear, hey, tell me how to be loving and, and a, tell me how to be a good parent tell me how to handle my checkbook tell me tell me that if I give God will bless me a hundredfold we want to hear messages we want to hear sometimes what we want to hear is we want to hear about how bad everybody else is right isn't that why gossip is so much fun let's be honest gossip is fun because you get to tell about how bad somebody else is right did you hear about? Right? We, we never, you know, we, we never gossip about, hey, did you hear? They're married, they've been married for this long and they're so happy and they're still happy. And they got a new car and they paid cash for it and we're just so happy. No, we go, ah, oh, 
Did you hear? You know, and we, and if and if if we hadn't heard the whole truth, we make up something, right? I mean, Sue Jackson is just half as bad as I've said she is. <laughs> I tried the whole sermon to get through it, but I just couldn't do it. But she's only half as bad. So half of what I've said is not true, but the other half is absolutely true. And so he says here that we've got to be ready. We've got to be ready to take the stand. And he says, guess what? There are going to be, there, it's a fact that people are going to run away whenever you begin speaking the Word of God. There are going to be some people that are going to go, I don't want to hear that. Because it's, it can be so convicting to us. Because let's face it, none of us want to be convicted. We would rather hear, I'm okay, you're okay, all right, let's dismiss and let's go home and let's not worry about anything until next week. And yet, if we're about what we ought to be about, we're saying, wait a minute, because we've come to the gospel of Jesus, we're saying, I'm a sinner, I have repented of my sins, my sins have been cleansed, and I am changing my way of life. I don't just have a form of godliness. I trust in its power. He is calling on us to be different. And when we talked about the church in one of our lessons, one of the things that we learned and we reminded ourselves of this, the church is the called out assembly. We are called out of our culture into the assembly of God. And because we are called, we are different. We are called to live different. Notice He never calls us to be perfect. He called us to be different. I realize today there wasn't a lot of pleasant here. And I can't apologize because it's what we need to hear sometimes. Sometimes I need to be the prophet that says, guess what? We have to change. We have to be different. Let's pray together. Father God.